I, I'm going to really follow up, I think, in a very interesting, uh, somewhat novel way on a lot of what you just heard and provide, uh, I'm going to try to integrate a variety of different things. And uh, typically, I give this as a one semester, two credit course on endocannabinoids and medical marijuana at the university where I'm chairman of the biology department, so I have the privilege of picking that course to teach. Um, originally, this talk was scheduled to be a half hour, but somebody backed out, so I'm very happy for that. I'm sorry that they couldn't come, but I'm happy from my point because I think it's pretty much impossible to hone down what I'm going to try to tell you into the half hour. And if we're lucky now, I will actually be able to change things. Yes, all right. All right, holistic, this key word here. Looking at the whole rather than the individual parts, the overall sum can be greater than the simple total of the individual parts. And that's what we're going to see. We're going to look at a physical chemical basis that drives this kind of phenomena. So I'm going to start out, and bear with me, because I will eventually get to cannabinoids, but I'm going to give you uh, really my view of what life is about. I've always been pathologically interested in life, and for the past 20 years, I've been learning with a great deal of difficulty, because sadly I'm a mathematical moron, um, a lot about physics, a special kind of physics called far from equilibrium thermodynamics. And since I've been able to make myself understand some of it, I think that I can communicate it to others as well. And we're going to see how that serves as the foundation for biology. And then we're going to see how the cannabinoids emerge from that. And then we're going to see how that in turn has this profound effect on politics and pretty much everything that we're involved with on a socioeconomic political level. So to try and tie all that together, uh, I will hopefully do that in some coherent fashion. So key concept here, life is a natural emergent phenomena that is based on far from equilibrium thermodynamics. Thermodynamics simply means the flow of energy, thermo energy, dynamics flow. And again, I, I keep emphasizing this point because we'll see how critical that is. What the bottom line though is that something new emerges that you couldn't predict from the pieces that were there. And that that newness is something that's truly larger than the components that created it. So creation is a key component of what we're going to be looking at here. So evolution, families, communities, economic, political, social systems are all far from equilibrium systems that were created and are maintained by the underlying physics. So life is a natural emergent phenomena based on the things that I'm going to tell you, which is quite contrary to what, sadly, we are taught. Uh, in pe people who've taken chemistry, I'm sure you've had your physical chemistry, uh, based on that, everything strives towards a greater degree of disorder. Entropy increases. There was a popular book a number of years ago called Entropy. Well, that has it all wrong, because that basically says life can't exist. And it turns out exactly the opposite happens when you look at far from equilibrium thermodynamics. It's basically when you have a charged battery versus a discharged battery. That discharged battery, you can't do anything with it. When you have a charged battery, you can do all sorts of things depending on what you plug into it. So it turns out that life is a balance of opposing forces. And that these, this balance of opposing forces is an intrinsic characteristic of living systems. So we're going to go into that once we go through the physics a little bit. And then we'll see how the endocannabinoid system has played and continues to play a unique role in evolution by functioning as a global homeostatic regulator. And our last talk certainly described some of the aspects of that. And I want to expand on that and take it actually even out of the realm of biology into the realm of politics and society. Again, though, uh, with a continuity to the physics that we're going to start off describing. So all of these systems are homeostatically regulated by endocannabinoids. Your cardiovascular, digestive, endocrine, excretory, immunological, nervous, musculoskeletal, reproductive, and respiratory. So I don't think I've left out any system. So, and by system, we mean you know, an organized entity within your body that's controlling and, and creating certain specific functions so that we can live a healthy life. 
So every single one of these is homeostatically re regulated, which is why we see such a huge capacity for medical marijuana to function and to help people. Because depending on what your disease is, you have a biochemical imbalance. And cannabinoids are a homeostatic regulator, meaning they try to restore balance. And again, that depends on which direction you're out of balance, and we'll go into a little of what that means. So what we're going to be doing here is bridging this new physics and biology. So far from equilibrium thermodynamics provides a scientific foundation framework for understanding life. And then this is a very famous second law of thermodynamics that says entropy must increase and entropy is a measure of disorder. But we all look around us, you know, everything's organized. We're organized, our world's organized, this conference organized. So something's out of kilt there. How does life which is very organized, fit into this paradigm where everything is apparently going towards disorder. So what about systems that are far from equilibrium? It turns out that, that the paradigm of going towards equilibrium, um, going towards disorder rather, is more characteristic of an isolated system. But if you have energy flowing into a system, like we have sunlight flowing into the biosphere, then we're pushing that system further from equilibrium, and it turns out that different kinds of properties occur. And this is just a, a balancing equation. It's basically telling you that, you know, if you have a leak in your bathtub and you're trying to maintain it at a certain level, you have to keep putting enough water in to maintain it. And if you put in too much water, it overflows. If you don't put in enough, it'll keep draining. And that's true here. Basically what I'm saying is that living systems require the continuous input of information, negative entropy, organization. We do that in terms of the food we eat, the sights and sounds and knowledge that we acquire. Those are all sources of information that push us further from equilibrium. So this physics was pioneered and founded by Ilya Prigogine, who sadly died last year. And he will have an impact on this current century that will be equivalent to what Einstein had in the last century. He got his Nobel Prize in 1977 for the concepts that I'm going to be presenting to you. And what I've spent my scientific career doing is trying to really integrate these concepts into biology. And that's what I'd like to share with you. So fact, large collections of molecules that are at or near equilibrium have fundamentally different properties from those that are far from equilibrium. And here's an example. This is something known as the Bernard instability. And what you have over here is a Petri dish with a liquid in it. And it's being heated from below. Now, anybody who's had any science, any chemistry at all, knows that when you put heat into a system, and a system now means a collection of molecules, that those molecules have a certain limited uh, repertoire of behavior. They're going to vibrate faster, they're going to rotate faster, and they're going to move around faster but they're never going to do anything but be random according to equilibrium thermodynamic thinking because it's just so improbable. How could you have cooperation between molecules? And what I want to show you here is that that heat flow serves as a source, just like the sun serves as a source for the biosphere. And at a critical point, the molecules organize themselves into these hexagonal convection cells. So this is a magnification of what you see on the right there. This is known as the Bernard instability. And what you're seeing here is cooperation occurring on a molecular level and occurring on a macroscopic level across these billions and zillions of molecules. They're working together. And they're working together for a purpose, the purpose being that they can dissipate more energy to the atmosphere above by organizing themselves, by cooperating, than if they didn't cooperate. And we know this, you know, if people work together, you can get more things done than if they're fighting one another. It's obvious. But it occurs on a molecular level. It's driven by underlying physics. So in this case here, this impossible situation of billions of molecules cooperating occurs naturally because it satisfies this, a basic principle that is characteristic of far from equilibrium thermodynamics. And that principle basically is that systems, collections of molecules, which is what we are, will organize